Hi, Dinesh. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, great to be here. Uh, so I've heard about you on Twitter for quite a while now from Visa, who's talked quite a bit about you and have always really enjoyed his threads about you. And then uh, recently, Cedric had a thread as well saying that uh, you know he had been mentored by you as well. And then you kindly popped in to interact with me to kind of answer some of the questions that I had. And so uh, just really wanted to have you on to kind of talk about the different mentoring and business relationships that you've had and, and how you see that kind of thing. Happy to help. Um, so, so let's start. I'd love to just hear about your background. You're, you know, you're the CEO of a company based in Singapore, and I would just love to hear kind of how you arrived at being a CEO and like what your, your story has been with business and what exactly your business does as well and, and that kind of thing. Sure. So I'm um, from Singapore. I studied um, in the U.S. for a bit, came back, joined the startup. I left that to start Anaphor, which is the startup that builds for full candy. Um, and the idea there is really, um, you know, how the, the idea for the product came about. We had a friend who had a kind of a retail shop and he had customers who loved him. He was getting, I think, a little bit of organic with a mouth, but he was trying to figure out, hey, what are ways to incentivize that, to turbocharge that? And he was looking out in the market. There really wasn't anything out there. We're like, hey, we can build this for you. And we realized that, hey, actually, we could build this for a lot of other kind of small, medium businesses as well. Because there wasn't really anything out there that was, you know, fit fit their needs and requirements. Um, he didn't have in-house developers. So, you know, it wasn't something he could, like, uh, build out or configure himself. Um, he didn't have, like, a lot of resources to hire a consultant. So we, we realized that, hey, there's a market here for these SaaS products that help these small and medium businesses, month by month billing, no long term contract, no setup fees. So, really um, built to fit the needs and requirements of these businesses. So, we started with referral programs, but we have other products in the works. But the idea really is to help these folks use technology to engage customers, grow their business, and so on. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, what's, it, what's it like to be a CEO of a company? What's it like? Um, you know, I guess there the are a lot of pieces to it, but at the end of the day, um, you, you just have some objective and, you know, in the, in the sense of a company, it's fairly straightforward. It has to deal with growth, has to deal with revenue, but you have that objective and you're trying to figure out how do you achieve that, um, with the resources you have. And so at the, you know, at the end of the day, you want to make sure you don't run out of money, but at the end, of, uh, you know, you also want to figure out how do you create a good environment for the people working for you? How do you help people grow? So there are a bunch of different objectives that you have, and you're trying to work backwards to, to figure out how do you achieve that with the resources you have. So that's kind of the, the general high level way of describing it. But you know, if you get in the weeds, it, the three main things, you want to make sure that the vision of the company is intact. You want to make sure you don't run out of money, and you want to make sure that um, you have the right people in place. But you know, that's uh, also a slightly simplified way of looking at it. You know, this. Yeah, you're a part-time janitor, you're doing all the stuff that nobody wants to do. Um, and at the end of the day, you're trying to achieve this objective with the company um, in, in the best way possible. Mm. That makes sense. Uh, what does what your like day-to-day -day life as a CEO look like? Day-to-day. -day, so I guess we're at, um, you know, we're a little larger than just starting out. So the, gen the people handling all the different functional um, teams, uh, the functional groups. And so kind of day to day, there isn't so much that um, I need to be in the weeds. So just making sure that the, the various managers aren't blocked by anything. They don't have any challenges that they can't address. Um, making sure we're well staffed. So looking a little ahead to what are we going to need in terms of hiring for the team in the next couple of months or next six months. Um, making sure, so we're cash flow positive. So it helps a lot on the funding side if you know, you, you don't have a worry about cash. Um, but previously, before we were cash flow positive, you always have an eye on, you know, what's your runway like, uh, fundraising, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, but day to day, it's just making sure nothing's breaking. You know, I guess one way of thinking about it is, um, so like I mentioned earlier, you have some objective that you're trying to achieve, right? In terms of um, growth or revenue and stuff like that. And think of yourself as, you know, you're balancing on this like large ball and making sure you don't topple, but you're trying to make the ball go to a certain place, which is the objective. But that's not, you know, you can't direct the ball to go there. You have to kind of 
you know, work with the ball, make sure you don't fall off. You know, it's sometimes going this way and that way, but you have a general direction in mind. And so it's a little bit like that. So stuff comes at you that you need to react to sometimes. Um, but in general, you're just trying to get there without anything catastrophically breaking or falling off the ball. Um, you know, that's one way of, of looking at it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's really helpful. It's, it's part of the reason I ask is just like, I, I've um, mostly been in a monastic context and also a nonprofit context. So it's just mm-hmm. curious to hear what it's like to be in the business world. And um, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so I'm, I'm especially interested in, as I mentioned, in talking about like mentorship. And I would just love to hear, you know, before I talk about, we talk about your own approach to mentorship, like, can you tell me about any important mentors that you've had over the years and, and what those relationships have been like? Yeah, so there's been a few kind of mentors maybe in Singapore, but you know, in the age we live in, there's so much um, information out there. There's so much good videos, podcasts, or, you know, you can hear interviews of um, a lot of, you know, business leaders, people who have done management before. So a lot of it is just consuming um, blog posts, uh, videos from these folks. There's um, Ben Horowitz. Um, he speaks quite a bit about management and running a company. Um, Andy Grove, obviously, High Output Management. So that's kind of one of the best um, books if you look at management. Um, I guess even Nassim Taleb's Inserto, so the Inserto series, um, Full by Randomness, The Black Swan, that gives you a really good sense of um, how the world works, um, you know, how you deal with information, how do you make predictions, things like that. And also Ray Dalio's principles have been helpful. So I would say that... Um, you know, that's a good set to give you a sense of how the real world works. How do you distill value out of that in the form of a business? Um, how do you manage a team to achieve that outcome? So there are like various personal relationships you've had in Singapore, but a lot of it has been through books and internet content that you've kind of assembled mm-hmm. your own perspective on things. Mm-hmm. Are you working with any like coaches or mentors currently that, that are mentoring you or coaching you? Not at the moment, no. Mm-hmm. Some of our early um, advisors definitely played that role in early investors. Um, but, you know, now I guess we're in a fairly good state in terms of the business. We know, you know, how this stuff works in general. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's interesting to me to hear you say that because um, uh, the the impression that I get is from reading Visa's posts and, and Cedric's posts is like, um, and, you know, we'll be diving into this in a second, but is of uh, someone who's an extremely dynamic and responsive mentor and is attuned to the person that you're working with and what their needs are. And um, it's interesting that you yourself have had uh, mostly that relationship through books rather than specific people that you're working with. And, and that's that you've embodied that into a living relationship with people. Yeah, I guess that is interesting. Um, you know, the thing is with mentorships and management and, and You know, it's all people, is dealing with people. And every person is very, very different. But people in general, you know, the the idiosyncrasies of people in general, in terms of blind spots, again, um, Nassim Talib talks about this a lot in his books. Those don't really change because, you know, people haven't, we don't evolve that fast. And so there's a general set of things you want to look out for. And once you get that, um, it's kind of a template for dealing with any individual person, including yourself in a way, right? So um, if you know how um, you kind of perceive information and how that impacts your worldview, uh, how that does for somebody else, you can kind of turn it on yourself as well. And so that helps you be, uh, you know, um, uh, helps you be a bit more grounded in terms of how you perceive information, uh, introspection, being self-reflective, so you kind of learn to be your own mentor and it's the same process for working with other people and they just might have different idiosyncrasies or weaknesses or blind spots. Yeah, and and it's, it's the same with you. So I myself have idiosyncrasies and blind spots. So I think the tricky part is not to, um, it's not, you know, that fact itself is not surprising because, you know, everybody has those. But how you try to see that in yourself is the tricky part. And, you know, maybe that's probably partly um, 
you know, brain wiring, I'd say um, being able to do that uh, well without, you know, pushing against somebody else for that. Um, so, you know, it's part of that, I guess. Uh, I, you know, it's difficult to answer that for myself. Visa and, and um, Cedric would be the best people to, to answer how they think I'm different from other people they see uh, in terms of needing mentorship or um, how we approach mentorship. I don't mm-hmm. know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, how you, you talked about a sort of a template for how you see people and how mm-hmm. you work with people. Can you unpack that a little bit? Like what kinds of things you're looking for or considering? Sure. So, so at the end of the day, and again, this draws a lot from um, Talib's books. Um, the way there are a lot of um, shortcomings people have in the way they perceive, you know, the world, their surroundings, other people. And, and stuff like that. And that leads to building up a representation of the world that is typically flawed, but also building up a representation of yourself that's typically flawed. And so what happens is if you build, um, and, and this is understandable, everybody does this, I do this, um, this is just the way it works. You know, throughout your life, if you haven't really been um, challenged in terms of uh, how you see your identity, what do you think you're good at, what do you think you're bad at, and typically school is, you know, a nurturing environment, but nobody really drills that deep. And so if you go pretty far along in your life without really um, examining that, you might be building a lot of what you're good at and what you're bad at on a foundation that you haven't really examined very deeply. And so what happens is, you know, you might be, you might be going pretty far in your career, um, based on a set of things that you're good at without realizing that that's built on a foundation that also limits you from doing something else. And it's very difficult to see that without having somebody um, press against that and compare their experience with yours. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. So Mm -hmm. say you're really good at um, software development and you're really good at coding and you might, you know, just as an example, you might be really good at coding because you hate going out and chatting with people. You're spending the whole day at home. And so you've gotten quite far along in your career um, in, in software development because you have a good, you know, you, you write good software or you write good code, but you realize that that was built on a foundation, on an identity of you being, you know, maybe not antisocial, but definitely not um, very social, right? And this is also in line with what your natural intrinsic traits are. But what you might not realize is that to get past that plateau, so to progress in your career or to have a healthier, you know, personal relationships, you need to change the way you think about yourself, or at least you need to accept that part of your identity is built on one of these pillars of being less social, but that's going to hinder you from getting to the next stage. And so going back and reversing that and becoming a more social person it's such a challenge to your identity that that's very hard to do without really um, seeing somebody else reflect that on you. Um, and, you know, it, it's a lot like, I don't know if you've heard of this um, term, local maxima. So, you know, say you're, you're doing hill climbing, right? You're trying to climb a hill, you're trying to get to the highest place. Sometimes you might hit a local maxima, right? A local high point. And to get to the higher point in the landscape, you need to go down first. And that's very difficult to do. And so typically to get to the global maximum, which is the highest peak that you can the, 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 you know, reach your potential to the best of your ability, you might need to go, you might need to regress in a way, right? Because your identity was built on a set of pillars that end up um, restricting you from getting to the higher point. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It does. Uh, mm. Can you tell me about... Uh, mm, well, maybe we could start with you. Like what uh, you, you talked about, like applying these skills to yourself and introspecting and reflecting on things. Like what, what are some of the kinds of things that you've discovered or challenges that you've worked through or uh, circumstances you found yourself in that you reflected on? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, maybe one thing, again, just to bring in Talib's um, in mm-hmm. such a full by randomness, Black Swan. I think, um, especially in a startup setting, there is 
it's you really pressing against reality in a sense. And so there are a lot of things that happen. Um, and there's a popular narrative about a lot of things in, a, in the tech startup kind of ecosystem or how tech startups work, especially because, you know, um, any industry that has, it's, it's flashy, it's kind of popular, there's money involved. There's a lot of narratives flowing around. And you need to figure out, okay, so to figure out the truth, so what is important, um, we use a term internally in the company, um, and this is not, you know, we didn't invent this. I think this was from Steve Jobs, uh, is this notion of the highest order bit. And what that means is um, that's just kind of how you represent numbers in, in binary, which is a, kind of a different numbering system, is there's the highest digit that you're trying to flip. So even if you look at um, a regular number, say, 984, right? Nine is that highest order digit. If you don't get that number flipped and you don't get that right, it doesn't matter what you do with the other numbers. So it doesn't matter if you get the eight to a nine in 984 or the four to a five, right? If you don't get that first digit, the highest it can be. And so- Wait, to be general, clear, is, the, uh, is the, the example 984 is nine the highest order bit because it's the first mm -hmm. one or because it's nine? Because it's the first one, so it's the yeah, it's the highest great. power, right? So it, it's nine hundred, not just an individual nine. The yeah. eight is just eighty, and four is just an individual four. So it could be like three eighty four, but you want to exactly. get that to a thousand. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, you want to get that three to uh, three to four. Okay, perfect. And so um, the 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 idea there is that you you need to figure out what is the most important thing in whatever you're doing, and when you're swimming in narratives, um, what happens is it's very easy to get distracted or to not know what is the most important thing to work on. And so to, to, to figure that out, you really need to um, have an accurate representation of reality, right, in a sense. And to do that, you need to really understand how you yourself craft representations of reality based on the information you perceive. So again, going to Fool by Randomness and, and the Black Swan and his books, um, a large part of how you perceive things, uh, you know, two large things that have to do with that is the, the unseen and randomness. So how you represent the unseen and also how you represent randomness in how you model the world has a fairly big impact on what you consider important, what's the highest order bit. And especially when you're swimming in narratives, you might build a model of the world based on someone else, you know, based on what somebody else is saying. And that person might just be either in their position because of randomness, you know, they got lucky, or there was some other factor that they didn't see and they over ascribed their success or some outcome to a factor they did see. And so all of these things play a part in terms of how you build a model of the world to make good decisions. And, um, you know, you kind of intuitively know that, that, hey, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there, the stuff I'm not seeing. But I'd say um, uh, Talib's books really give you a vocabulary for having those conversations with yourself. And so I, I think that helped a lot. It helps you see, um, you know, who might have gotten lucky and knows what they're and doesn't really know what they're doing, who might actually not be so successful, but knows what they're doing. And because of chance, they got hit with a path that, um, you know, ended up not being right. But their advice is actually a lot more important than somebody else. And so modeling those, you know, um, is, is important to kind of make decisions that are maximally useful, get you further along and so on. What are some of the kinds of signals that someone is uh, mistakenly successful or haphazardly unsuccessful? Yeah, I guess one of uh, a somewhat easy way to tell is from the way somebody speaks, you'll be able to tell if they understand the limitations of how they perceive the world and how, you know, how they perceive reality, the models that they're building from those perceptions and the language they use, um, you know, can, it's fairly obvious whether they think that what they see is all there is or what they see isn't all there is, right? When you've internalized the fact that what you see isn't all there is, you will, um, you know, what Nassim Talib calls an 
epistemocrat. Um, and that's just somebody who has a, um, you, know, uh, you know, without getting too technical, it's just somebody who has a healthy respect for what they don't see and a healthy understanding for the fact that a lot of what you don't see and randomness play a part in the world that you do see. And so incorporating that into your models, I think is super important. And so anybody who writes in a way or speaks in a way that, uh, you, you know, betrays a lack of understanding of that is generally a tell that they might just have gotten lucky or they're they are looking at things potentially not in a way to build a very useful model of reality, right? Because, you know, you've probably heard the phrase, so all models are wrong, all models of reality or in general, but some are useful. And so what you're trying to do is look for useful models. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. It does, yes. Um, so we were talking about how you've applied these things to yourself. Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk about and shift gears to how you sort of mentor people. I mean, uh, mm, uh, feel free to answer this how you like uh, using specifics or in generalities. But how do you how do you work with people that you're mentoring or mm -hmm. coaching or you know advising or in a managerial role? Like how how do you approach that? Uh, what what does that look like exactly? Yeah, it's it's fairly simple. So it's just the most important thing is just to help them get better in a, in a sincere way. And, you know, say in the context, in, a, in the context of say mentoring, you know, you, there's no other objective, but say in the, in the context of a company, obviously the company has some objective it's working towards. And again, that's growth or revenue um, or other softer metrics. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to align what is in the company's interest with what is in this individual's interest in helping them grow. So what you're trying to do is find some fusion or some middle point where um, there's a set of tasks that will help the person grow and help the company grow. But in general, the, the mentor side of that is just, okay, so how do you sincerely help this person grow? And, you know, that's not very, if you, if you kind of start from first principles, that there isn't a lot to that. Generally, the person has some current understanding of what their objectives are. Those could be flawed. Those are likely to change. All of that is fine. And helping them discover that itself has a lot of value. So if they think that they want something, but actually it realize that, again, back to what I was saying about their representation of the world, they've built a faulty model of the world. And as a result, they have a faulty model of what they are looking for, what's best for them. That's a journey that's also helping, uh, helpful for them, helpful to helping them achieve, um, even if you don't help them achieve the objective. But anyway, so they have a set of objectives, um, at least at that point in time. And what you're trying to do is help them achieve that objective. And gen generally, I mean, people are um, not flawed, but people have very natural shortcomings and limitations to how they perceive the world and stuff like that. That is, it's fairly easy to, uh, you know, it's fairly predictable that everybody, you know, myself included, has a set of shortcomings that, um, that their identity was built around potentially, that is potentially also holding them back from achieving the objective or to realizing what the real objective is. And just helping them work through it is a, a first principles way of approaching it, right? So, and to do that, the first thing you need to understand is, okay, so what is your objective? What are you trying to achieve? Um, why are you trying to achieve that objective? What is that based on? And so once you've kind of mapped that out, and that process itself can be pretty helpful because, you know, nobody's really put in those words. And so once they realize that, okay, so I'm doing all these things either in my role in the company or these things I'm doing outside, I'm doing them to achieve this objective. Once they've kind of articulated that, then you can work backwards from there and figure out, okay, so what are you doing right now to achieve the objective? And then it's just a matter of sharing my own perspective of the world. So this is how I would achieve that objective potentially, or this is how I've seen other people achieve that objective. And I guess the thing is, if you are um, you know, dedicated or you're, you're very deliberate about building the right representations of the right models of the world, um, like I've mentioned, um, doing through, uh, you know, figuring out how your model of the world is flawed, why it's flawed and so on. 
so if you're if you're fairly you know and I I like to believe that I'm fairly deliberate about building useful models about the world. But if you do that, what happens is in general, you have a lot of useful models for other people as well. Because um, in a lot of cases, especially if you're reading books, like if you're reading Ben Horowitz or, or Taleb, and you're trying to build a model, a useful model of the world based on what they're seeing, you are actually end up building a fairly context independent model because you don't have super deep insight into their individual context of how they live their life or what their personal lives are like or what their childhoods are like. You know, nobody's going to share that through a book or a video or interview or whatever. So you're trying to build a fairly context independent model. So something that is helpful to them, that's also going to be helpful to you. Right. Uh, and if you are successful at building useful context independent models, that generally ends up being very helpful to other people. You can be very helpful to other people you meet as well because, um, you know, you can't solve their problem end to end, right? So you don't know deep inside of what their childhoods are like. And, and you're not trying to do that because, you know, that's um, it's very difficult to build a model that's so extensive that's going to be able to fix that. But the models you do have are going to be very useful because they're limited in how much they can help. But they're almost definitely going to be helpful because they're context independent. So they're not, you're not building them based on you having to live like Ben Horowitz or Nassim Taleb or Andy Grove or whatever. You're building a model that, okay, it doesn't matter if, if it, I'm me or them, right? And our contexts are very different. I'm trying to build a model that's based on what was useful to them that's going to be useful to me. And in general, those models are useful to people that you're trying to help out as well. So... Kind of, that was a slightly rambling answer, but the TLDR is you try to figure out what the objectives are. And if you can articulate and map that well, what happens is um, I would like to think that I have a set of models that can help them achieve that because I try to build context independent models for myself, you know, useful context independent models of how the world works. So if they have an objective, I can tell them that, hey, you know, have you tried thinking about using um, this to achieve that objective? Or have you looked at this particular model of the world or this, this way of looking at the world and testing their models as well? Right? Why do you think that's true? Because they have built a model of the world based on their perceptions and what they've read and what they've watched. Right? So kind of decomposing that in general is, is a lot of the work. And, and once you do that, the, the solutions kind of pop out um, in an easier way. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, all of mm -hmm. that makes sense. It's extremely helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about, um, you were saying that often people don't, you know, kind of aren't aware of what their goals are and then they mm -hmm. articulate what their goals are. And then sometimes in the process that goal shifts and it clarifies and becomes something else. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of like, wh what are the kinds of goals that people that you're working with tend to have? And then maybe could you give an example of like how those might shift into something different? Yeah, so, um, um, you know, you know, Visa's talked about this a lot pretty mm -hmm. extensively in its Twitter, Twitter stream, um, but basically there's some, sometimes a very um, ambitious uh, idea that they're trying to achieve, an ambitious kind of objective they're trying to achieve, but you don't think about, okay, so what are the intermediary states to get there, and what is the skill set that's required to get to those intermediary states, right? And so then when you when you decompose that or you distill that, you realize that, okay, so actually I'm not trying to go to the moon or Mars or whatever. I'm first trying to build a set of skill sets that help me um, write well, communicate well, manage a team, stuff like that, right? And so once you see that, it's not so much your objective changes. It's just that your near-term Kind of what you do day to day changes because instead of kind of fantasizing about, hey, you know, let's achieve this grand vision, you realize that what you need to rewire yourself to do is be um, find happiness or feel that you have been successful, uh, not by doing the ambitious thing, but by taking that first step and getting better at managing a team, for example. And so, what happens in a lot of cases is that people can't achieve that larger vision and they get demoralized. But what you want to do is rewire your brain a little bit to get motivated by carrying out the intermediary steps well. 
And also what happens a lot of the times is once you break it down that way and while you're doing the intermediary steps, you realize either that, hey, okay, so I realized to get to that overall objective is much harder than I thought or it's really not aligned with what I'm good at or what I like to do. But I realized through doing these intermediary steps that I'm really good at X instead of Y and X leads me down another path. And I realized that that other objective, which this um, other skill set that I discovered I'm good at, I'm, I'm much better at doing that. And actually that, I have a much higher chance of impacting the world by doing that, right? That's one class of thing. Um, and again, v Visa can speak a lot more about this um, and he speaks about it much better. Um, another class of thing, like I mentioned earlier, is, is some you know, team member and executive might um, find a lot of success in life because they've been following a particular formula Again, just to use the software development example, because I'm a software developer by training, um, you might be good at software development because of a set of skill sets, or a set of personality traits you have, but you might not realize that, hey, that set of personality traits ultimately becomes a plateau. I mean, causes me to plateau and becomes a limiting factor for me to achieve the next level of my growth, right? And it can be very, very difficult and challenging to unravel that and go backwards almost to, you know, build a new pillar of your identity, right? So if your identity is, is built on the pillars of, you know, I spend a lot of time in front of the computer. That's what I'm good at. Um, you know, I, I'm generally not a good salesperson. I'm generally not good at public speaking, but that's fine because my identity is built on those pillars. And I've achieved a lot of success in life based on these pillars. And you've built your ego on top of that. You've built your identity on top of that. You might hit a point where, okay, I, I feel like I'm plateauing, right? I, I'm a good software developer, but I can't manage a team, right? Which is potentially the next progression up. Or I'm a good software developer, but I, I can't really architect a product because that requires communicating um, those concepts to a bigger group. And, you know, you can hit... a uh, you can hit kind of a roadblock because without really having somebody to bounce that against you, you're not going to realize actually the way forward is to take three steps back and stop focusing on software development for a while and focus on um, communicating with other people, um, figuring out whether I like to lead other people, inspiring other people. And that's like, I mean, it's very understandable that that is very jarring and hard to do, right? Even when I've, um, I had to do things like that in my life. It's been very, very difficult to do. And so that's understandable. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out, okay, so what, what are you trying to achieve at the end of the day and what's required for that? And sometimes that might go, that might um, mean working, uh, you know, walking backwards. Again, like the hill climbing example, right? To get to the higher hill, you might need to go, you may need to go down from the hill that, it, that has been so comfortable, that you're used to, that you've been getting accolades for, that you've been getting promotions for, that your family has been proud of you for, that can be an incredible difficult thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, sometimes that's required. So that's kind of maybe a, another bucket. Uh, maybe a third bucket would be sometimes the realization that, um, you know, what, what you want to do at the end of the day, once you have your objectives really clearly mapped out, the other thing you want to have a good understanding of is what are you good at uh, or what is play to you that is work for everyone else? Or what is easy for you that's difficult for everyone else? And so, you know, again, without getting too um, in the weeds about this or too technical, you know, the way I see kind of maybe success in, in a general sense is, um, is a combination of those things. So the, the very first thing, like I mentioned, is you need to figure out what are you good at that, what, what is easy for you that's hard for everyone else? And how do you find a domain, whether it's business, your, your personal hobbies or whatever, how do you find a domain where success in that domain is, um, is really bounded ideally by the things, by the, the skill set or the personality traits that are easy for you that's, and difficult for everybody else or play for you that's work for everybody else? And making sure you acquire any auxiliary or adjacent skill sets that 
prevent you from achieving that in that domain. Again, um, that's a little abstract, just to maybe give you a concrete example. Say you want to be really good at software development, right? And, and that's, that's what you feel um, the, the domain you want to be really good at. You realize that, okay, so to be a good, really good software developer, the most, the primary trait, the bounding trait really is um, architecting good code, writing good software, stuff like that. So the first thing you need to do is figure out, okay, so it feels like writing software is play to me, but it's work to everybody else. Okay, great. That's a very strong signal for figuring out what domain you should pursue to find success in, right? And it's, it's play to me, it's easy for me, it's, it's hard work for everybody else. The second step you want to do is, okay, in that domain, what are the other traits that bound success in that domain? So like the example I gave you earlier, um, you, you realize that actually to achieve you know, um, disproportionate success in kind of the software development domain, okay, does that mean you want to start a software company? Does it mean you want to lead a large team at, you know, kind of uh, at a Google large kind of tech company, or is it something else? And each of those kind of configurations require a set of other skill sets that might bound success in that domain. So if you're trying to manage a team, obviously that's going to partly also be, you need to want to communicate well, you need to want to manage people. If you just want to be an architect, sure, you might not need to want to manage people, but you still need to communicate your ideas well. You need to be able to place that software in the context of a large organization. Um, it might even be open source. So that's a different domain. You might not require a bit of the stuff I talked about before, but open source itself, itself requires a bunch of skill sets that um, if you don't have, are going to bound success in those domains. And so to, to figure all this stuff out, first, what you're good at, what, what's played to you that's worked for everybody else. Really, you know, sometimes it might be a parent that you speak to and, you know, your parent might know straight off the bat that, hey, this, you know, I think um, uh, Ra Naval Ravikant had this example where he grew up wanting to be a scientist or physicist. And back when he was young, his mom knew that, no, that's not what you're good at. You're good at talking. And so you're going to either be a salesperson or you're, you're going to be um, doing something in a domain where talking is, you know, is a bounding factor. And that's really where he ended up. He's good at communicating and stuff like that. And so it's folks like that will be able to tell you, hey, you might think that you're, you, you might want to be good at something or you might think that you're good at something, but actually you're good at this other thing. And the, other, the thing that's actually played to you is something else, right? And so it, it sometimes takes bouncing those ideas against somebody else to, to discover those. Um, and so that's where um, it might help to speak with someone. Being able to provide that external perspective or context in a lot of cases is what mentorship is about, is about what management is about. But in general, once you start with those kind of key first principles, they're trying to achieve some objective. They're trying to achieve success in some domain. How do you help them achieve that? Uh, using the models you've seen of, of what works in the world, um, that's generally it. So in this process of clarifying people's goals and helping them to mm -hmm. uh, you know, find intermediate goals to work on that are helpful for expanding their range. What are, what are some of the uh, conceptual models that you find yourself reaching for again and again? Yeah, so the kind of models you want to use, again, are, are very ideally context independent. And so those don't need to be really form fitted to a very personal situation. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of stuff. So all the, 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 the um, kind of authors or the speakers I've mentioned before, they're fairly good models. Charlie Munger, um, he famously has um, writes a lot about this, and he has a lot of context-independent models as well. And so, in general, the set of you know kind of first principle context-independent models that are useful, there aren't actually that many of them. And all the really key thinkers, I, you know, the folks I listen to, pretty much all circle around the same idea. So. Um, you know, if, if you watch Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger speak, they don't reference Nassim Taleb's inserto a lot. And, you know, Nassim Taleb, I guess they're, I, I don't know any of them personally, but their personalities are very different. But they converge on a lot of the same first principle truths. And this, again, deals with representation of the unknown, how randomness plays a part in success, or how you view the world. Right, the vocabulary 
you know, they, they converge along the same things. And once you see that, you realize that, hey, wait a minute, there's some truth here, right? Quote, unquote, truth, right? There's some model here that's useful. Um, and once you incorporate that into how you perceive the world, then that starts standing out when you watch other people speak as well. So how it marks, right? Another investor, um, he, again, uses very similar vocabulary. He clearly, without overtly refer referencing these other folks, he has a very similar mental model, a very similar model he uses that's, um, that's found him success in life. So when you kind of triangulate those things, you come, come across a set of very um, common set of themes or models to these folks. And, you know, Talib, uh, I've, you know, his, his writing is sometimes described as difficult to parse and not super friendly um, to the reader. But there's a ton of, of truths, right? Howard Marx has, um, I think, described Talib's works as profound. And, you know, I'd agree. There's a lot of stuff in there that's very profound in that it, there's some truths or some models in there that are very context independent. And once you see them, you realize that a lot of the narratives and a lot of what you read and you see out there is, you know, maybe not inaccurate, but definitely not as useful, right? The models and the narratives that are thrown at you aren't as useful because they're sometimes context dependent. They sometimes don't internalize or don't incorporate the fact that there's randomness and there's um, kind of stuff that you don't see in the world. I don't know if that answers the question. Mm -hmm. you, you've sort of circled around this a little bit, but um, there's this, I don't know if you've read much Plato, but there's a concept in Plato of like, a lot of the dialogues are about like trying to uh, uh, give an account of how the universe is created, and mm -hmm. uh, a couple of times in different dialogues, they 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 create something called a likely story, a likely mm -hmm. story, and it's like it's agreed that it's it's false from the start, but it's still mm -hmm. a likely story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I'm wondering if you could give me a likely story of uh, what it looks like practically for you to be mentoring someone over, over say, you know, a well, one or two year period that someone comes to work for you, they're mm -hmm. reporting to you, uh, mm -hmm. they have some objective that you clarify. And, and what mm -hmm. is that? Can you tell me a likely story about what that might look like? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of it is, is fairly custom to where the objectives start. Right. Mm -hmm. And also um, in a, in a company context, it's slightly different from just a friend or somebody else, you know, somebody who's approached you for mentorship, that's also a slightly different context because the in a, in a company context, you know, we try to help everybody uh, everybody grow. But at the end of the day, you know, we have customers, we have stakeholders, we have investors. So there's a bit more of a, you know, you know at, at some point, there needs to be some common understanding of, hey, can this work or not? And so in general for, um, but in general, what, what's common I'd say to both of those is you start from an objective and, you try to work out, okay, so what, uh, let's just describe the objective. Let's describe what the, um, uh, what's preventing, preventing you from getting there. And it usually takes a few sessions in. So, you know, I do quite a number of one-on-ones. And in general, what I found is um, the thing that holds people back is typically one large thing rather than a lot of small things. And in general, the large thing is what we end up speaking about over the next you know, two years, right? So initially, there's a bit of work that you need to do to make them realize that, oh, okay, so this is what's kind of holding me back. Either in a professional setting, on a personal setting, sometimes those are related, right? Um, and getting to that acknowledgement is not super difficult because typically, you know, nobody has really sat down and and really gone in the weeds with them about something like this. And so they're sometimes surprised, but they get it pretty quickly that, oh, okay, so I'm either bad at communicating, or I'm bad at um, you know, looking at things this way. And then what happens is to resolve that, generally the lift is from the other party. So they need to do a lot of work in terms of figuring out, okay, so why, is, why, why are you limited by that, right? Is it um, something that you're not good at uh, from childhood? Is something you've been avoiding. And then the rest of the, the, the tenure of all the chats are generally dealing with that one issue, triangulating that with more people, um, getting them to really internalize that it's true and how to fix that. And in general, if their whole life they've grown up 
having a particular perception of themselves and having a particular identity, that's not something you can flip overnight, right? That takes a while to work through. And it takes a while to rewire your brain and rewire your identity in a way to from, um, hey, I'm great at software development, but that also means I'm, ter- I'm terrible at public speaking and that's okay. Rewire, going from that to, hey, okay, I'm a good software developer who can also do public speaking is non-trivial. It's, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of external work. It takes a lot of speaking with other people to convince yourself that that's both important and true. Um, and so in general, the rest of the, the time is just spent on, on that one thing. And, you know, um, I, I bring up the difference between a personal setting and kind of a company setting uh, as well. And the, the other difference there is, I think earlier I mentioned what is super important is to figure out, hey, what are you good at? What is play for you that's work for everybody else? And if after this process, you realize that, hey, I'm, I've been hired to be a software developer, um, and I realized that to succeed in this domain requires a set of skills that I don't want to acquire. So it requires public speaking that I don't want to acquire. Then you need to figure out what you want to do instead, right? If it's not software development, you should do something else instead. And at that point is where, you know, we might realize that, okay, so it doesn't make sense in a company's perspective that you are still a software developer. Okay, so we'll help you with that. But, you know, it doesn't make sense for you to be a software developer within the company. In certain cases, we'll look for other places in the company that they can do that, right? The, the new thing that they discover, they'd rather do. Sometimes that doesn't work out, but kind of in a personal mentorship capacity, that's easier because, I mean, it's more important to go figure out um, what is easy and play to you and hard work for everybody else and then pursue that new rabbit hole. And that itself has a set of constraints. You might require a skill set that you need to be good at. And so that's a separate conversation, but... In general, helping people through that is is what that process is like. Some initial phase of discovery of, okay, my identity has been built on a set of pillars. Okay, actually those pillars are wrong or um, insufficient. I need a new pillar to build my identity on. And then once you discover that, then there's a whole much longer process of, okay, building that pillar, taking down the old pillars that actually were a constraint or, or holding you back. Mm. That makes sense. That's that's a, a long journey that you walk with someone. Uh, yeah, but you know, at the end of the day, if your genuine, sincere um, objective is to help them be better, um, you know, there's no other way to do it. And um, especially if you can help someone be better at a, you know at their job at work in a way that helps the company as well. That's just you know kind of a sweet spot that's mm-hmm. very fulfilling. In, in multiple dimensions and very rewarding if you if you get that to work. And, you know, again, like in that Twitter thread that um, I mentioned about Visa, you know, it's I, I don't do a lot of the work, right? I just chat with a person for an hour, half an hour, right? It's not like I'm doing the work. The work is always, the, the most, all of the heavy lifting is done by the other party. All I'm doing is I'm sharing what I hope to be a context independent, useful model of the world that I've built with this person which I'm going to do anyway. So I do that on the side and I need to do that. For, you know, and I'm inclined to do that. That's what's easy for me. That's what's played to me. That's mm-hmm. what for other people, right? And so I just bring that into a conversation and I'm spending about half an hour a week, an hour a week, you know, in, in, a, in a company setting. In a mentorship setting, is even rarer. I don't, I don't meet these folks that often. And so it, it's so cheap for me to do that the, the potential upside, it's such a convex bet, right? The, the potential downside for me is like you know, an hour a month or whatever, an hour a week, right? But the potential upside, especially if this person grows and um, um, fulfills their potential and the kind of impact that Visa has had on people outside the company, outside Singapore, it's, you know, it, that's very rewarding. And the cost to me is, is so negligible that, you know, all those encounters are generally very rewarding. I, I'm curious to ask, like, how do you, understand or perceive what he's doing currently uh yeah you mean visa specifically or in general yes, visa specifically yeah so what he's doing i guess um so visa you know without getting you know going too deep into visa because you know he's not here and he speaks a lot about this in his blogs mm-hmm. and, and his Twitter thread. every individual and visa is definitely one of these very very unique individuals and he um, you know, uh, again, I've described him as a genius to other people before. That's definitely true. 
he's a son of genius and um you know working through that is difficult right working through your genius and i again i think visa is a genius working through that genius is difficult and it helps to have an external perspective and again this is you know not not even about visa everybody usually um uh has a very strong set of skills and again this ties down to what's play for you that works for everybody else in visa's case very obviously what's play for him or easy for him is writing and um if he goes deep into that and you know with my help or anybody else says figures out okay what are the auxiliary skill sets that you need to have to unblock yourself from that whether it's project management or whatever um but everybody generally once they figure out what's play for them that that's worked for everybody else and that very unique configuration the kind of impact that they can have in their company in their town in their in their country in the in the world is is dramatic can be dramatic and um you know i've seen that happen in the case of visa you know visa is more public about it but the other folks like that cedric writes a lot as well right um so if you can unlock that without trying too deeply to understand what they should be doing or whether they are achieving the potential or whatever if you just start from curiosity in terms of hey okay what do you think you're good at what are you trying to achieve um this is what i think do you agree um it generally lets them converge around what they're best at how they can benefit other people most i don't know if that mm-hmm. makes sense it does it does it's interesting cuz one of the things that was on my mind is like you were talking about this focus on uh goals and objectives and then like mm-hmm. clarifying the goals and finding intermediate goals and one of the models that i found most useful is uh like conditions consequences if you're familiar mm-hmm. with that of like uh rather than trying to have a specific goal that has a specific outcome mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and a path to it you you try to set up the conditions for there to be good consequences mm-hmm. and it sounds like that's what you're doing with the people that you're working with is just like amplifying their skills so that something good happens even if you don't know in advance yeah. what it's going to be yeah maybe another way to describe it is i'm not specifically trying to evaluate whether their objective is right i'm just providing a mirror for them to see what their objective is right and so the thing is it's impossible for me to evaluate whether visa's objective at the end of the day is right or cedric's or anybody else's because you know i don't have their skill set what's play for them is not play for me and my model of the world past a very simple core set of context independent models is very flawed so trying to go too deep into hey should visa be doing what he's doing or is that the best way that he can benefit the world that's really out of the scope of i mean i have no model for that and i don't i don't want to try to pretend that i have a model for that all i'm trying to do is make him articulate that um and press against that with models i've seen and what happens at the end of the day which is natural and should happen is the objectives change right once you've articulated that um you might realize that it's different but then i don't try to then say oh okay so this new objective is better or worse than the previous one i just apply the same set of principles to the new objective which is okay so let's articulate that how do you think to achieve that here are some context independent models of the world that i have that i would use to achieve that do you think that makes sense right what are your models and the meta conversation is very similar the actual conversation itself is different and very unique to the objective itself which i'm not qualified to have right but the meta conversation about okay so the the way you approach objectives is generally the same i e you have um you're trying to achieve it with a model or you you've built that objective based on a model and and just is model comparison more than any kind of um um judgment that you're placing on objectives or what you should or shouldn't be doing and you know in general again like i've uh, mentioned what you find is um objectives change people discover things about themselves which is natural which is understandable this is what people are and rather than trying to get them to the quote unquote right objective you're just trying to help them evolve their current understanding of what their objective is because that might not even be a journey that ends right that's a perpetual journey and you just want to help them along those path that path rather than get them to some kind of end point i don't know if that makes sense it does yeah yeah i mean um 
it reminds me that you know you're you're talking about it being rewarding on multiple dimensions, and mm-hmm. I imagine it's it certainly must be you know like profitable for you, and then also I imagine it's emotionally satisfying to see mm-hmm. these people like succeed and flourish, and then mm-hmm. I, I also imagine, and, I, and I'd be curious to ask about this in particular that it's um, uh, that through this process iterating with people, you know, mm-hmm. one person over years maybe, but also many people in parallel, like you yourself are refining the way that you approach this sort of thing and that that is its own kind of fulfillment. Would would you agree with that? Yeah. And, you know, all of this helps, you know, like I mentioned, you know, what, um, again, without being too presumptuous, I guess what I'm, what's easier for me and what I like doing, right? What I, it's kind of in my, my wheelhouse is really trying to figure out useful context, independent models of the world. and Having these diverse set of um, other models to compare against is tremendously useful. So it helps you figure out, okay, it helps you test your models, um, y- you know, your models of the world. It helps test those against other people's models. So that's rewarding as well in its own, in its own way. Can you speak to any, like, uh, cases where your models broke or you found a different model applied better or your models were refined or things like that through, through the mentorship process? Yeah. So, um, I, I don't know if it's through the mentorship process necessarily. I mean, all of these, let me maybe put it this way. Um, you know, when, when you, when you read something, like even when you read, say, Nassim Taleb's, uh, the internal series and its books, um, what happens is to really internalize and, kind of understand whether that's a useful model of the world for you requires having life experiences to hang that model on top of. And, you know, I'll give an example of why I say this. I've recommended Taleb's books to others before, and they clearly haven't found as much value from them. And that used to be puzzling until I realized that, hey, the reason why I'm able to um, learn from these books, and there's a reading part of reading type of learning and there's a doing type of learning right if you don't have kind of life experiences to hang those words you're reading or those concepts you're you're, you're trying to perceive on if you don't have life experiences to hang those on it's it's harder to convince yourself that hey this is actually useful this is actually true in, in a sense and so having these other experiences and and listening to other people's models it's it's you know, it's all this large, it's, it's kind of a pool, you know, of, of experiences that you're submitting them into. And you have a whole set of kind of a subconscious um, intuition about it. And, you know, um, Talat talks a lot about platonicity uh, and, and how you're trying to find, you know, there's a, again, without getting too, too much in the weeds, you have an underlying reality, right? And the only way humans can perceive that reality is by, squeezing that reality through these platonic ideals, right? And, um, and so, you know, when you draw, when you're trying to model a tree, you're trying to draw a tree, that ends up being a set of pixels or a set of colors, which is an approximation of reality and itself is a model of reality. And so I don't want to go down too, too deep down the path of trying to represent how useful I find external experiences in incorporating new information I receive, whether it's reading Taleb or reading uh, Ridalio or uh, Ben Horowitz, um, those experiences help in a way that I'm unable to describe. And, you know, I will be doing it a disservice. All I can say, you know, the, the most useful way I can describe this is all these experiences kind of enter your subconscious in a way and they help you they act as hooks that you can ha- uh, hang new things you read on top of. And that helps you determine whether something is quote unquote true or not. That helps you determine if a model is useful or not. I don't feel like I'm doing a, a very good job describing this, but you know, kind of, I don't know if that makes sense. So am I hearing that, uh, I just want to dive into one particular mm-hmm. thing you said, that mm-hmm. the, the reason that you found Taleb useful where many people don't is that you had real world experiences to match it onto that maybe other people didn't? Yeah, so I don't know if I'd say match it onto. I'd say um, you're comparing his experiences with your own. 
And when he um, denigrates, or uh, he's, he's, he has very strong opinions about uh, certain groups of people. I don't know if you've read Talib's books, but he has strong I opinions. I, I've heard about it. He has uh, strong opinions about different groups of people. Um, you need to have some experiences yourself to figure out, is he kind of a crotchety old man? Or is he, is there accuracy in what he's saying? And the problem is that there are a lot of truths that cannot be spoken in public. And having done a startup and having been part of another startup, which is, you know, by any means successful, I realized that there are a lot of things about, you know, maybe narrowly startups, but about the world that cannot be said. And the, the problem about not being able to say these things is it does a disservice to the general, you know, not population, but anybody else who doesn't have the privilege of experiencing these things firsthand. What happens is if they go by the, they go by the popular narratives, which exclude all of these truths that cannot be said, what happens is you might then read Taleb and think that that's totally inconsistent with all the narratives I've heard. And so he's got to be crazy or he's got to be wrong, right? And it, it's really insidious how that works because um, that ends up only allowing a smaller group of people to have a continually reinforced set of better models because the 10% of the truth that the, you know, the, the, the popular narratives don't talk about, though that 10% allows you to evaluate Talit's writings or whoever else in a different light than everybody else that would make you make it much more easy for you to incorporate his model into your own worldview. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, what these things do is, um, you know, mentorship is definitely part of it, but all these experiences and when, um, you know, you speak, you know, not necessarily with Visa, but all these folks, um, in general, these one-on-one -on -one settings allow you to hear things about them or understand things about them that obviously they wouldn't say in a public setting or, you know, isn't part of the popular narrative of, you know, general mental health or general well-being or general how do people achieve success in life, right? There's a general narrative about these things. But when you do one-on-ones, especially with a large group of people, you realize that that general narrative is sometimes wrong in a certain set of ways. And that truth, that 10% of the truth, which the general narratives exclude, helps you internalize some of these models a lot better. Yeah. When you say that some things can't be said, do you mean like they can't be articulated or they're not like polite to say? Uh, a bit of both. A bit of both. That yeah. Definitely the polite to say. And, you know, a lot of people have spoken about this. So I think, um, uh, I mean, there's been a lot, I mean, U.S. presidential quotes about how after they get into the White House, you know, there's whole reality that we see that they can't speak about. So it's part of that. Or even world leaders, right? Anybody who's managing a large organization, community, country, you can see it in the way they speak. There's a, there's a large set of truths they, ca they can't speak. So that's part of it. The other part of it is, is what I'm saying, um, what I mentioned earlier, which is this sense of uh, platonicity, which is when you are experiencing an underlying reality, when you try to distill that down into advice that you give someone else, the only way you can do that is via these platonic ideals, right? And Talib talks about the platonic fold, which is the place where the underlying reality, which can't be described, press, presses against the symbolism that humans use to describe experiences to other people. So there's a gap there, right? There's a set of things that you, that's in an underlying reality that you experience when you're actually doing it, that is impossible to distill into words or phrases or anything else you can communicate because communication itself is very flawed, right? The, the the mediums you have for communication are very flawed. Um, you know, Twitter restricts this even more, and that's why you you know there's a there's a lot said about this in terms of how when you keep restricting communication more and more, you get a very flawed understanding of what reality is actually like. 
And so there's a bit of that where it can't actually be articulated because the tools you have for articulating reality themselves are flawed and restricted. And so part of that is you need to actually experience the underlying reality. And so this is why some part of learning is, is doing, not, not reading, because reading necessarily squeezes this reality. Um, you know, the, the bit of procrastinate is, again, um, a talent kind of aphorism um, about how you're squeezing reality into this set of, uh, set of symbols or set of things that you can communicate. And by doing so, you're chopping off a head or you're chopping off the feet or you're, you're really chopping off parts of reality to squeeze it into this model that you can convey. And again, I don't know if I'm doing justice to any of this. You should really read uh, uh, in Sato, right? Uh, I mean, the, the books, he, he describes this a lot better than I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think you're doing great. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I really appreciate. Um, it reminds me that like, there's a bit of an internet culture norm of like, don't ask a question that you can just Google. But uh, in, in my case, I often like to ask people questions that I know they, that I could Google because mm-hmm. the way that they articulate it is often more uh, palatable or comprehensible mm-hmm. or available. It's a different so I, perspective, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I would actually personally prefer to hear you talk about it than, than read to lab. I mean, you know, it's definitely up there since you're recommending it so highly. But, I guess you, uh, should, you should do both. You should, you yeah. should do both. <laughs> yes, right. Fair, yeah. fair. Uh, yeah, yeah so like just that. just to answer that question, so it's a bit of both. It's it's what you can't say as well as, um, you know, what's not socially acceptable to say as well as what you can't say because of the limitations of, of how we communicate. Yes, right, right, right. Uh, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I want to ask about this from a different angle of like, uh, about parenting and how, how mm-hmm. you know how you approach parenting and being a dad and uh, mm-hmm. how that relates to the mentorship roles that you find as a CEO, if at all. What's that? What's that like for you? Yeah, so I mean, my kids are a little younger, three and one. So mm-hmm. um, you know, there there aren't so many parallels with uh, kind of mentorship because you know, folks who are older generally you know have have a bunch of you know, you're not. <laughs> it's less kind of jungle type. Um, mm-hmm. kind of experiences. But I guess what's similar is um, incentives. So it's very clear that in- incentives play such a huge part in driving behavior. Um, incentives and expectations, I would say. So with kids, um, you really have to strategize a little bit about how you use incentives and expectations of incentives to drive a certain behavior. You know, in a more raw way, obviously, with kids, um, you know, it's kind of you're bludgeoning them over the head with incentives. Um, but it, it's very similar with, you know, mentorship or, or management. Um, it's a bit more nuanced how you use incentives, but it's generally the same. And, um, you know, in both cases, you're trying to help them achieve some potential, their potential in a sense. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, in, in a company setting, it's more um, a more nuanced use of incentives. You know, even the fact that you care about their growth is an incentive, right? And so it's, it's meta incentives as well, right? Not just, hey, you know, get dressed for schools and, you know, I'll, have, I'll let you have this cookie or whatever. It's, it's more, you know, I'm not trying to just give you the incentive. The incentive is that I'm trying to help you grow, right? So it's, it's, it's a bit more nuanced, but at the end of the day, it's incentives. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's, um, you know, I have incentives. Everybody has incentives. Incentives are just um, the way you reach some objective. And so as long as you're clear about that objective, again, which, which can change. Um, you know, with a kid, the objective is a lot, again, a lot um, more obvious. With, with somebody older, there's a bit more nuance there, but it, it's generally the same. Yeah, I mean, I imagine there's something similar as well of what you said of, um, like you were talking about how, I mean, from a certain perspective, you have like financial goals or specific project goals that you need to achieve as mm-hmm. a CEO, but then mm-hmm. but then you're also trying to like mentor someone in an open-ended way where you're allowing mm-hmm. them to come into like, you know, like blossom as who they are in their own mm-hmm. uniqueness. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, I imagine that that's similar with, you know, I mean, your kids are pretty young, but like you have no idea who they'll be as an adult mm-hmm. and they'll probably mm-hmm. be someone you didn't expect at all. And you're just trying to set up the conditions to make that possible. Yep, exactly. I think though that happens when kids are, are slightly older, 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, at this age, it, it's a very short term. So you have a very short term objective. Okay, get them dressed to school, get them, yeah. get them to bed. Um, but <laughs> you're right that um, when they get a little older, it, it definitely starts. Uh, we can see a little bit of that now with the, with the older ones um, in terms of what we hope for the chief. You know, don't get addicted to screens, um, uh, interact with other kids well. So th there's a bit of that. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of similarities there. Yeah, so I, I, you know, with all that kind of in play, I'd love to open it up into kind of more of a conversation of like, uh, there's a few things I'm curious to ask about based on this. Um, but I'm, is there anything that feels like nearby to what we've been talking about that you'd like to share? Uh, I mean, nothing beyond, um, uh, you know, it's very trippy once you kind of distill the fact that. Um, you know, you have so many models of the world and, and you're just swimming in narratives and models. And once you internalize that, it can be pretty trippy. I don't know if you've heard of the Gelman amnesia effect. So that's a, a phrase, uh, I think my, Michael Crichton um, came up with that. That's the fact that you can look in, a, when you read a newspaper, you sometimes come across an article um, which is, uh, has to do with the domain that you're super familiar with. So say I read an article about startups and like the report is totally wrong about that. That's not how it works at all. Um, you know, they got causality backwards. They're like, you know, who is this idiot? And then you turn the page and you read something about Middle East peace, uh, American politics, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's super interesting. And, and like, you think that that's so insightful. Um, and you realize that it's, it's all these narratives that you're swimming in. And, and without having a really grounded sense of what reality is like, it's very easy to get swept up in that. And especially if you don't have a healthy respect for how your representation of the world can be flawed, again, via um, things that you don't see or randomness at play, you can go down very, you can go down a lot of rabbit holes that are hard to come back from. Because again, you've built your world model, you've built your identity on top of this thing. And then when you ultimately go try to the, you, when you go to the Middle East or you go to the, you know, wherever and you actually encounter reality and you realize that, oh my God, it's like so different from this model of the world I've built. Um, you know, it's really disturbing, right? And, and there's so much that, that happens, especially when there's something more cutting edge. So, you know, one example, maybe crypto, right? So there's so much written about crypto and there's, there's so many newspaper articles. It, there's so clearly so many narratives that are getting pushed that you know when you actually dive deep into some of these things you're like mm, that's not that's not how it works at all right mm. Mm. Yeah. and Absolutely. once you realize that it can be very very trippy can you say a little bit more of like mm -hmm. what is this disorientation like for you or, or why, why is it disorienting for you i think what happens is the first couple of times it happens it's very disorienting um mm -hmm. and you know, again, an example like I gave is if you ever read a kind of a popular media article about um, a topic that you're really, really in the weeds about, you have, a very, you know, you, you realize that there's a very jarring difference between how something is presented to the kind of the common group versus how you as an oper operator um, establish it. So the first couple of times that happens is very jarring, but the side effect is after a while, that then just gets you desensitized to all information and you, you just start trusting stuff a lot less. And maybe trust is not the right word. It's just that it's not that you don't trust it. It's just that you allow fewer things in to shape your worldview. And so then it becomes less jarring. It's just, um, it's like, you know, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink, right? It's a bit like that. Um, there's narratives and information everywhere, but there's information nowhere. There's nothing you can use. And that's a very um, trippy state of being. But the, the flip side is, is that when you do find something that, again, um, based on your models of the world is super accurate, something Howard Mark says, something Talib says, you really get really, you really latch onto it. And it's kind of exciting in a way because you, you found, you know, some information you can use to build a better model of the world in this, you know, 
flood of maybe not false narratives, but less useful models, right? In, in a sea of less useful models, when you find a model that's very useful and especially context dependent, uh, context independent, it, it's really, it's quite exciting, quite exhilarating. I'm, I'm, the question I, I'd love to ask just to kind of close out is uh, I, I find myself being a little bit uh, and, and you, sh you should feel free to answer this however you want. Uh, <laughs> sure, it's a yeah. little bit, it's a, it's a different level of a question than we've been talking about. But, sure. mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, obviously I don't know you especially well. I have a sense of you, a, a poor model of you, shall <laughs> we say. Uh, but, but things like don't quite add up for me about mm -hmm. like why, why you would choose to do the things that you do. Mm -hmm. Like I imagine, um, you know, uh, you've started this business, so you feel responsible for mm -hmm. seeing it succeed and you have kids. And so you have to take care of them. And mm -hmm. you also, I imagine you get a lot of satisfaction out of your work, but, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm also curious about like, uh, and this may be bordering on like impolite because it's like mm -hmm. things you can't normally say, but like, why, yeah. why would you choose to do the things that you do as opposed to something else? Yeah. Uh, what, what would the something else be? What's oh, an example? Well, uh, I mean, um, you know, I'm doing a lot of nonprofit work. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I kind of, uh, I mean, for, from my perspective, and this is just maybe where I'm coming from of like, I'm coming from. Oh, gosh. I mean, you know, a simple example, another example would be like uh, working on some uh, political issue or an environmental issue or like, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for me, I'm like trying to, I've like vowed to save all beings across time and be a Buddha at mm -hmm. some point. So, mm -hmm. so like, that's where I'm coming from. But, 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 you know, like, uh, I see, I see people, mm, like, I see this with people that I read in the business world of, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm people having exceptionally good models of how the world works, like mm -hmm. executing on what they know to be true, getting mm -hmm. a lot of satisfaction for it, like profiting, but then it's mm -hmm. also like to what end? It seems mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. insubstantive, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So that's, I mean, that's not difficult to answer. So um, yeah. one thing it's interesting that you you mentioned nonprofit. So um, very likely um, I will be doing some form of that. I mean, not maybe in the near term, Probably with my wife. Um, we've chatted about that a lot. Um, interestingly, um, I just sent Visa a, a note about that uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, mm. But, you know, we will, uh, you know, to get that though, so that's the goal, right? And this is, um, you know, slightly similar to what I mentioned earlier. So that's the goal. But I do want to, um, I acknowledge that my models of reality are flawed. And, you know, they're better now, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, they're probably still flawed. In, in probably very deep ways. And what we want to, what I don't want to do is um, decide how to, quote unquote, help the world. Um, you know, what the, you know, if I do a nonprofit, what the nonprofit will be without first getting a very, you know, without first having very useful models, very accurate models, useful as accurate as I can get them context independent. And so my objective now changes from, hey, how do I do a nonprofit to give as much as I can to the world or, or whatever form that takes? That now completely is removed. Maybe not now, but maybe say 10 years ago, whatever, right? It's completely removed from my immediate focus. I don't care about that at all. All I'm trying to do is how do you build very good context independent models? Because what I also acknowledge is my understanding of what nonprofits are and how to improve the world, and whether my unique skill set will be compatible with how nonprofits help the world, all of that understanding is built on potentially faulty models I have of the world. So it's very dangerous. You know, I would feel it's very dangerous for me to go too down deep into that path without first getting a very, very uh, robust set of models to work from. Okay, so now that you have your new objective, which is how do you build a set of robust models? Then, okay, what are really, really good ways of building robust models? And that, that's a very, very easy question to answer. You need to um, interact with reality in a way that's direct and um, 
not being uh, without an intermediary, right? Let me give an example. So all throughout your life, um, you know, when you're a kid, um, when you're a junior executive, or you go to work from someone, there's always some, there's always either somebody or a group of people between you and you know the underlying reality, right? So when you're in school, um, and again, this is not a knock on school. Schools have a purpose, and and you know there's a very specific set of things that they do, but. Um, School distills reality for you in a certain way. It says, hey, if you get this set of grades, especially when you're younger, when you get this set of grades, you get a quote-unquote A, you're successful, you get promoted to the next grade or whatever. Um, this is how you uh, read or how you do certain things. It's a very prescriptive way of, uh, you know, this is how you achieve quote-unquote success in life, right? The problem, though, is when you really internalize that and you interpret reality through someone else, whether it's through teachers or education system in school, or whether it's through your boss or a massive organizational apparatus in, in an organization, a board of directors, you often get a misleading sense of reality and your models are flawed in some very fundamental ways, right? In, in a lot of cases, you don't even know what your objective is at the end of the day, right? So in school, um, school has a sp specific um, sense of what success is. Visa talks about this a lot, you know, given that we've talked about him. Um, he had, you know, probably not a super pleasant um, school experience, which is super understandable given what his strengths are and, and what his objectives are. So the problem is, is once you do that, um, you have a very flawed set of models. And so the only way to, to get past that and to, and to unlearn a lot of those, unfortunately, is to go cut through all of that and, and find situations where you really interact only with the underlying reality. Guess what's a great place for that? It's actually to do your own startup. This is actually also part of the reason why I left my previous startup, which was you know, successful even, by the, you know, even at the point I left, to do my own thing. Because even in that scenario, I was placed in a situation where I was having reality interpret it for me, right? And what I want to do is only, only when you have a bank account that if it goes to zero, everything ends, or um, if you really don't get a customer to pay you money, um, you know, this whole thing ends, only when you interact with reality in that raw way, or, you know, there's so much stuff that, again, that can be commonly said about management, some stuff that can't be said about management, a lot of stuff that can be, it can be said commonly about people and can't be said about people. But anyway, it's only when you put yourself in these situations, um, you get to build accurate models. And again, so if you're trying to achieve some end, say it's trying to help the world by a nonprofit or whatever, and you realize that to do that well, you need to build a set of useful models. The way to do that, and it takes time to do that, is by putting yourself in an environment where you are really interacting with the underlying reality and um, again, what happens when you can do that is I can, you know, very, with a high degree of confidence say that if I hadn't um, tried to run this company, try to start the startup, build these products, understand how people work, understand how the German amnesia effect, how popular narratives can be wrong, I would not have the same ability to internalize uh, what Nassim Taleb writes about in the way that I feel I've done now, right? Mm -hmm. And so with that new model, um, you are much better equipped to figure out, okay, so is a nonprofit the best way to do about this? Um, especially in your own context, right? Which is your own strengths. What is played to you that's worked for other people? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, it makes sense. Uh, there's a few things there. Like one is, I mean, a more polite version of my question would have been, you know, what are your own goals? <laughs> so sorry for asking it the rude way. And then what I'm hearing is like you have uh, uh, like highly positive long term goals that you want to reach, but that like for you, the best thing to do in the intermediate stage is like build up your models of the world mm -hmm. and so that you can use them effectively. And that the best way to do that is to like run a business where you're rubbing up against reality mm -hmm. like constantly. Yeah, and I, I'd probably go further to say that I would not even say that that's what my end goal is. It's very difficult to, um, so I can give you a sense, and all of those are, you know, it's, 
I'm no more special than anybody else. People generally want to do good. People in general are optimistic. You know, I've been very, very fortunate in life through many dimensions. And I there's a lot of gratitude. And in general, anybody in my um, situation wants to give back and wants to express that gratitude in a way that helps people. And so I don't think I do that more than anybody else. So, you know, you could say that that's my goal, but I don't think that goal is really different from anybody in that situation. So really the goal is more than intermediary goal, which is how do I get very, very useful models of reality? Because once I achieve that goal, everything else kind of sorts itself out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. So I wouldn't even say my goal is that the end state stuff, because there's nothing really insightful about that. The unique goal to me, you know, potentially unique and more in line with what's uh, unique about my skill set or what I find easy is really the fact that I'm trying to build these useful models um, and internalize them. Definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, yeah, again, it sort of, it sort of uh, clarifies that part of the reason I wanted to ask is... Uh, mm -hmm what I know about you breaks the models that I have. So it's like, I want to mm -hmm. sort of test out how I, I mean, especially, I mean, a lot of the models that I've been interested in myself are about people because I just mm -hmm. like, people are very confusing to me. So it's like, why do mm -hmm. people act that way? What are they doing? Mm -hmm. uh, how so do I interact what, with them skillfully? What model did you have that you felt like? Um, as much as you can articulate. Yeah. Uh, let me try. Let's see. Mm -hmm. um, I, I couldn't imagine that I would deeply enjoy what you were doing if I were you. I would imagine that you would enjoy mentoring uh, and mm -hmm. that you would enjoy learning mm -hmm. and growing, but that like you might not feel fulfilled by the specific context in which you were using those skills. Uh, this is super interesting to me. So um, if you can speak more about why, why, you, why you feel this way. So wh why do you think that? Why? Or, okay, maybe another way of phrasing it is, what do, you think, uh, what do you think fulfills, what do you think fulfills me or people like me? Or, so it sounds like your model is, um, you have some understanding of what fulfills <laughs> other people. And that's yeah. incompatible with something. So if you can just speak more about that, because that's probably where the crux is. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, I think part of it is probably, I mean, almost, almost certainly it's it's like uh, um, putting what I know about myself mm -hmm. next to mm -hmm. what I know of about course. you. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so for me, mm -hmm. I know that one of the most powerful things for me is, um, like I, I, I do get enjoyment out of the like, I'd say mm, short-term, mid-term things like uh, doing a task well or um, or like I, I love mentorship myself. I love when people mm -hmm. ask me for mm -hmm. advice and I can help mm -hmm. them. That's extremely satisfying. Certainly, I get that. But like in terms of putting the pieces in place in my own life, mm -hmm. I really want and and find satisfaction in knowing that the thing that I'm putting that effort towards mm -hmm. is like the highest good that I can possibly do. Uh, mm -hmm. So when I look at something like a business context, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it seems like a lot of businesses have like slight positive effects at best, often neutral effects and probably more often like net negative effects in terms of what they're doing for the world. Super interesting. So yeah. I, if I were to, um, uh, so the only thing I would add to that is, yeah. Um, if you, so it, it sounds like you have a, a model of how businesses work or what they do. And if you can speak more as much as you can, how did you build that model? Is it from reading things? Is it from speaking with entrepreneurs? Is it from having a personal encounter, a personal negative encounter from a, a corporation that, you know, did something mm -hmm. or. So it feels like you have some model of the world and you mentioned, so that's super useful. What you said about. Uh, slight positive, maybe large neutral uh, or large negative. How, how do you how do you build that model? What does that mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why uh, why do you think that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, well, a few things. So one is, I mean, I, I've been reading business stuff for a long time and I've learned mm -hmm. a lot about business things. I mean, mm -hmm. Uh, for example, like, I mean, I love Cedric's blogs. Like I love mm -hmm. the things mm -hmm. that he writes about it. And I often mm -hmm. have this, I've talked with him about this. I often have this particular issue come up because I'm like, I, I think the business world is extremely good at executing and like mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. things well. And I mm -hmm. love that. It's like, mm -hmm. I want to do that for say nonprofit stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and nonprofit stuff often like execution is like, Ooh, and that's so good. So, mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, but uh, how do I build it? Well, 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 one is coming from a sense of um, uh, ooh, there's a flavor that's been in the air from hearing you talk of like, mm -hmm. um, you, you talk about like interacting with reality. And it occurs mm -hmm. to me that a lot of what you're talking about is like essentially human social reality. And so like you talk about business, for example, being a way to like get very fast feedback from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. reality but that's actually a social human reality mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. so for me mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. oh there's a few layers of like mm, being aware of the planet and the environmental damage that we're mm -hmm. causing and mm -hmm. the fact that that's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. human systems hurting non-human mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. one thing mm -hmm. and then there's another angle of like uh, having done just a, an immense amount of meditation and like mm -hmm. seeing things from a perceptual level of like mm -hmm. perception is not human or non-conceptual. And so it's like business is extremely, this is how, just how I see things right now. I'm, I'm totally mm -hmm, open mm -hmm, to business, mm -hmm, but like mm -hmm. business is exceptionally good at operating, executing mm -hmm. in a human social reality, but human social reality, as I understand it, is like itself a net negative for the physical environmental substrate on which the human realm is built on and that that's like i mean i mean this isn't polite but frankly <laughs> it feels like suicidal to me where we're like collectively shooting ourselves in the foot <laughs> because <laughs> we forget that there's a ground underneath us you know yeah yeah so a couple of things i'd add to that so one is um two two things to drill down to so you you said that the execution of nonprofits is um i, I can't remember the word you use tricky oh, or well, let's go with sloppy right now <laughs> so that is a very very um, useful thread to pull on because um, so you have you know some goals that you're trying to achieve. It sounds like nonprofits potentially can achieve them in terms of the the natural environment. You know that's a mm -hmm. way to marshal this human collective effort to helping the non-human you know the, the the environment and stuff like that. But the mechanism to do that is potentially through a nonprofit and. Exactly like what you said, if you feel that to achieve your objective requires human coordination, say, let's just say via nonprofits, and nonprofit execution is sloppy, your goal translates to how do I execute nonprofits in a non sloppy way? And the answer to that, you know, according at least to what you've said, is profit based corporations, which execute in a non-sloppy way. So do you see how um, wanting to understand how corpor corporations execute in a non-sloppy way is required to possibly, and I'm, I'm not making any judgment here, I'm saying hypothetically is the way to execute non-profits in a non-sloppy way is the way to achieve the high goal. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think there might be some assumptions in there that mm -hmm. like more information would have. But like, I mean, I've been writing about business strategy and like having conversations like these for a while and like mm -hmm. try to I, I try to use the models that I've learned and the skills mm -hmm. and the practices mm -hmm. in a nonprofit setting. And then that generally goes quite well and is less sloppy. And mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, and I'm I'm not also I'd say both for myself and, and for you. And, you know, I was like judging your life earlier, not mm -hmm. just again, by a way of investigating mm -hmm. the model here. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not attached to like a nonprofit model so mm -hmm. much as uh, there's a bit of an aversion to mm, the business world of like, is this the best thing that we could be doing with our human potential to like, mm -hmm. we're, we're doing more damage than good, I'd say. So like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And when you say more damage than good, you mean more damage specifically to the kind of the natural environment? 
uh, to the natural environment, but also like humans are a part of that environment. And I see us <clears throat> hurting humans in that systemically as well, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it does. I guess the only thing I would I would say is that um, the underlying reality is very, very messy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if um, an assumption that there's a way to achieve an objective for the greater good, either the, the national environment or not, in a very binary way with, without having the messiness that is required when you involve humans in the mix. I don't know if that's possible, right? And, and so maybe a way to rephrase that is, you have some goal of, so I guess what you're trying to grapple with, and trust me if I'm wrong, is it sounds like I'm trying to help I have some greater kind of objective, whether it's the national environment or the greater good, even if it's kind of human affairs. But the way that I'm investigating how to do that, which is possibly through a for-profit corporation, is a very messy way of achieving that objective. So if that's true, what I would say is that assumes though that there's a non-messy way to achieve those objectives. And I don't know if there are or aren't, but the only way to be able to tell whether there's a non-messy way, and, and you know, just to articulate non-messy a little bit, is that to have a higher human, you know, the human species to achieve a higher level of being might require a lot of local pain and a, lo a lot of local um, regression. It might. I'm not saying it does or it doesn't, but I wouldn't assume that it doesn't. And only reality, which I know is very, very messy, will be able to tell you whether that's possible or not. And so my goal is no longer about, hey, can I help kind of a broader objective in a non-messy way? My objective is only translated down to let me understand reality to see if this is even possible. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It does. Uh, let me come at this from a different angle, just in case it helps flesh this out a little bit more. Uh, and, and you're just like, we're just going to enter my reality here for a bit. Yeah. Okay. Totally fine. Uh, Sounds good. Uh, uh, so, uh, oh man, this is yeah. Here we go. <laughs> so 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 long term. I'm ready. My goal yeah. is to be a Buddha. I want to be mm -hmm. a Buddha in a future mm -hmm. lifetime. And I see a Buddha as someone that is capable of meeting each and every single person and being of benefit to them so that mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, move forward on their own spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's going to take many, many, many lifetimes of like learning how to mm -hmm. be a being so that I can help mm -hmm. each kind of being. And ideally the point of being a Buddha is to save all beings so that all beings come to, the end of their spiritual path to awakening. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't see that happening in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I look at mm -hmm. this guy and I'm like, mm, I don't think so. You know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. like there, there are amazing skills that I have. There's, there's things that I can do to help the world, but it's like, mm -hmm. not, not this lifetime, but <laughs> uh, it's going to be, you know, many lifetimes between mm -hmm. now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so I want to use this lifetime as effectively as I can. And um, help as many people as I can and gain as mm -hmm. many skills as I can. Mm -hmm. And then I look around and I see uh, a world that is suffering a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're, we're destroying the planet and mm -hmm. species mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. an ex extreme rate. Mm -hmm. And then I also see humans suffering tremendously, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like anxiety, suicide, mm -hmm. depression, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. huge problems. And then I see like, other things going extremely well where like the human systems are growing mm -hmm, rapidly, mm -hmm, profits are up, you know, these kinds of things. This, this is an overly simplistic read of the world, but mm -hmm, basically it's complex and messy, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I look at myself and the skills that I have mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, how do I uh, be of benefit to others and grow myself in the circumstances that I find myself in? Mm -hmm. uh, and that looks like nonprofit work. That looks like tweeting a lot. That looks like having this conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it looks like mm -hmm, dancing a lot. 
I'm doing a lot of dancing these days, <laughs> meditation. I, it, and it's not obvious to me how it all fits together, but it's very exploratory. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, that's like, that's a whole worldview that like, is, is it sort of different, different lens than what I imagine you're inhabiting on a day-to-day -day basis when you're like doing one-to-ones with folks or you're like mm -hmm, sending mm -hmm. out a report to your investors or things like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, the, the, the bit to unpack that, maybe let me start by, so just a disclaimer, I'm not super in the weeds about Buddhism, so I can't sure. speak um, to that a lot, but I guess where the intersection is, is you mentioned this thing about trying to do the, the, m the best you can, the most you can to, uh, I mean, I, I think we are in agreement in terms of observations about how the world is flawed, right? Uh, you know, whether um, uh, in, in terms of either the national environment, people getting more stress, social media, possibly inducing more stress. So I think those observations are common and there's also a common objective about, okay, so how do we help this as much as possible? I might not do that in kind of a religious setting or whatever, but that doesn't matter at the end of the day. So the, the common touch points are that, right? So we're trying to achieve the same kind of goal there. I guess I just, where- Just to pause for a second, like yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not engaging in this conversation to like convince you otherwise. I, oh, yeah, it just I feels know, like know, fruitful to like yeah, yeah, yeah. be like, where are models different yeah, and what yeah, what's going exactly. on here? That's totally yeah. we're, we're totally aligned on that. So um, yeah, so the the kind of the observations and objectives are the same. I would say where the difference lies is um, I once I have that realization, I kind of shelve it. I put it in a box, right, and I keep the box on the shelf. And I'm like, okay, great. So that feels like what I want to do. That sounds right. But once I've internalized, and I hope I have, that all you see is not all there is, I can't go too deep into any one box because any box that I'm looking at is built on my understanding of the world, which I've acknowledged is flawed. I'm not saying it's wrong, but there's a limit to there's a limited amount I can I can say is, is right, right? So let me just give an example. Say if I feel that, okay, so social media has clearly made people more envious or, or really reduced conversations to sound bites and that's bad. There's a limited amount how convinced I can be that's um that's quote unquote bad or can be fixed. Because how inevitable that is or how much that is um, is a natural progression of just human evolution, it's very difficult to make that call when you know you have a flat, flawed model of reality, right? So I can't act with too strong of a pillar that says, hey, social media is bad. Let me go all out to educate the world that it's bad and make people stop using Twitter. It's difficult for me to do that because that is built on a foundation that I'm super sure that social media is avoidable, inevitable, uh, you know, avoidable is not inevitable, can be changed. Um, so, so what I do is I, I pause all of that and not that I'm not trying to achieve it, I am, but I pause it. And first I, I try to figure out, okay, so how do, so how does social media even work? Why does this exist? Why do people even use it, right? Why do they like it? Why is this addictive? And, and, and why is somebody trying to monetize that? And the thing is, right, okay, so then you, you pause that and you shelve that. And then you go backwards. Okay, so how do organizations work? How do corporations work? Why do people behave the way they do? And, you know, if you keep going backwards and, and what you start from is, okay, it looks like a lot of the core parts of this is, okay, so, I mean, capitalism, which, again, is a very platonic phrase for a vast array of things that it means. So, okay, so let's figure out how, quote, unquote, capitalism works. Okay, a lot of that seems to do with customer value. What is customer value? A lot of that has to do with human coordination problems. How does human coordination work? Um, so, you know, I, I guess that's how I approach it. So it feels like where you start is once you have that, you, you go forward from there. Whereas I'm going backwards from there. I'm like, okay, wait. So let me not go down that path. Let me, let me go backwards and try to get the axioms figured out first, right? And if you go down that path long enough, you will get down to these domains where you really interact with the reality. Startups, investing is another one of those domains. Capitalism, kind of, because what happens is 
only there do you really nail down what the axioms are. And then I can go back to the box and open it and I'm like, oh, okay. So I thought Twitter was bad, but hey, actually Twitter is in inevitable. I thought, um, you know, social media is bad or whatever. I mean, this is just, just an example, but I, I, you know, I don't want to make a judgment too far into that without first investigating kind of the stuff that can't be said and the stuff that aren't in the common narratives. Because when you hear the thing about, oh, you know, corporations are evil. And, you know, again, this is not a judgment of whether they are or aren't. But when you hear that narrative and you have a meta conversation about yourself, knowing that there's a layer of, you know, there's a layer of stuff that can't be said, which actually is, is kind of a key to unlocking a lot of puzzles. You start from a kind of a, a first principle approach to, okay, so what is this thing? So what is, you know, how does this, how does startups work? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it reminds me of, well, one, I'm I'm hearing like, mm, you can't hold your views of reality too firmly. You have to like (laughs) investigate them more closely. And there's a kind of humility in that that I'm hearing. Yep, Uh, exactly. And I'm reminded of uh, just a lot of situations that I've been in where I'm like holding things quite tightly. And then people are like, but what the way that you're seeing things doesn't fit like something that's very important to me or that that's real in my mm-hmm. world. And that's, it's like alienating for people if you're like mm-hmm. holding something extremely tightly and that, that misses them mm-hmm. or, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. But that's where you sometimes run into trouble. Right. And you know, this is, I've been guilty of this as well. If you hold something on too tightly and this actually ties into what I said a little earlier as well. So if you've built your identity, around say you're good at software development or corporations are evil or you know whatever else and you realize that hey wait a minute i've never really examined this pillar and when you do it can be very jarring right Mm -hmm. and alienating and and everything you described which is spot on Mm -hmm. but the, the point is to get past that plateau might require it and i'm not saying it does i'm saying i don't know Mm -hmm. and the only way to know quote unquote is to actually go to that part of reality, poke it, you know, twiddle with it, ignore the narratives about it. Maybe not ignore, but in the context of the narratives about it, poke it and prod it and see, okay, is this consistent with what I'm hearing? Oh, wait a minute, Mm -hmm. it's not. Oh, wait a minute, this is totally off. Oh, wait a minute, gentleman amnesia effect. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And that is very, very, can be very, very trippy. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Hmm. Well, I, I want to go on record just and say, like, uh, I think corporations are evil is like, or or business is bad or something like that would be um, an overly simplistic straw yep. man of what I'm trying to say. Like, I, I have a lot of yeah, admiration for understand. business. Yep. And so mm-hmm. on. Uh, I don't think you were misreading me, but I just want to put this on record since we're recording yeah, yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's just the straw man to, as an example of, of what I mean. And that's obviously an overly um, simplistic example of it. Yeah, it's more it's more just like, hey, we have we have problems here and I might not be yep. completely clear on what the problems are, but like it, for me it's like a felt sense of we need to do something about the problems. Like I'm not completely sure what they are or what the solutions are, but this might not be working for us or the planet or things like yeah. that. You know, we're aligned there. What I I might not do is use the word problem that because that has um, you know, more negative connotations than you know, that starts influencing the conversations I have with myself. So what I'd mm-hmm. say is Related in this causality are corporations, right? A lot of stuff that from a first reading feels flawed with the world deal with corporations. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me go investigate what corporations are like, you know, not in a super in deep, not necessarily in a, in a super in-depth way, but at least let me get a sense of which narratives about that are flawed and correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because that is going to give me a much more useful model for figuring out how do we tweak this causality around corporations to achieve the end, I think is the right end, which is, you know, um, a better world or whatever. And, you know, the thing is, I also acknowledge that in the process of understanding those models, I might realize my model of what's good for the world was flawed. And it's really being, you know, humility is a good way of of saying it. Epistemocrat, again, 
Taleb's kind of phrase, it's a really good articulation of that where you know you have to start more with curiosity rather than building too much on top of the narrative that you hear because um you know there's a lot of stuff there that if you if you're not careful with can give you less helpful models of the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense yeah <laughs> uh, there's uh a tremendous amount that I'll be taking away from this conversation, mm -hmm. not just about mentoring, but also just uh, looking at the world and how to make good use of our lives. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm tremendously appreciative of you for having this conversation, um, you know, not just the interview, but also really going into the thick of it with me in the last sure, half hour yeah. or so. So really appreciate it, Dinesh. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks. This was really fun. Mm.